The address is 1004 Austin Street. Does that sound familiar? Does that ring a bell to anybody? No. All right. Well, good. 1004 Austin Street. At that address is a home that was built, a house that was built um, in 1985 uh, by a gentleman that was around 30 years old, and he had uh, been saving up his money for several years. Um, in fact, he saved a lot of the money that he was able to save while he was in college, and then uh, built this house over the course of a year, year and a half, and, and then he and his family moved into this house on 1004 Austin Street, and uh, just a modest home, nothing super fancy about it. Um, in fact, if you were to drive by it, you would probably not even pay attention to it. You would probably not notice anything about it. You would just drive right by and you would think, well, there's just another house, another house on the street. But 1004 Austin Street is a significant address for a certain, certain group of people. It's the address where uh, three boys grew up and where they were raised and where really the majority of their childhood was shaped and, and formed many, many years ago. And now those boys are grown up and uh, they're all married and have children of their own. And, um, but that's the house that would be insignificant to you, but that's the house that Wesley, Thad, and Clay Jackson grew up in. That's my home. That was my home address. It's a home to me, but you, were, you would drive by it and just completely think nothing of it. But to me, it's special. It means something. There's a lot of memories there, but more than there just being memories about that place, there's a lot, the majority of my life and the majority of how I think and how I act and how I respond to things in life and relationships that I find myself in, friendships, so much of all of that was shaped by the home. Homes are significant. They're important. And we all come from a home. We've all lived in some kind of a home. And I know that lands in a lot of different places for all of us, but homes matter. And I think it's easy to think that they don't matter. But last week, we started kind of really focusing in, as we're walking through the book of Ephesians, we really began to focus in on the family structure, the family dynamic. And Paul has been leading us through all kinds of truth about God and what that truth means for us. And then he started really focusing in on as a result of us understanding the truth about God and the implications on our lives because of who he is and what he's done for us, then our lives ought to look a certain way. Our lives should be some sort of a response to who God is. And as he continued through that, he began to get more and more specific. And last week, we began to talk about some of the relationships that we find ourselves in. And last week, we talked about husbands and wives. But if you remember, prior to the text we read about husbands and wives, if you go back and you read the verse right before that, which is Ephesians chapter 5, verse 21, it actually says that we are to subject ourselves to one another in fear of Christ. In other words, understanding who Christ is, who Jesus is, what he's done for us, then we live in response to that. And the adequate response to live is a, is a, a response of submission to one another. Husbands submitting to their wives, wives submitting to their husbands, uh, children submitting to their parents, parents submitting to the leadership that they have been given over their children, which is where we're going to, to land today. So if you have your Bibles, you want to turn to Ephesians chapter 6. That's where we're going we're gonna to read. And we're only going to read four verses out of Ephesians chapter 6. Like we were cruising through the book of Ephesians. We were taking big chunks at a time. And it's like we got halfway through Ephesians 5 and we kind of hit the brakes. <laughs> and we've really slowed down because I think there's some critical passages for us to focus in on that are incredibly important for everyday life for us today. And so we talked about the marriage dynamic last week. And in that same context of living in submission to one another, I want us to look at the, the home dynamic when it comes to parents and children. And while you're looking for the book of Ephesians and going to chapter six, which is the last chapter in the book of Ephesians, we're almost done. Um, after today, we'll have two more weeks left in the book of Ephesians and then we'll be done. It'll be in the rearview mirror. But as we look in today, two things I I want to say before we, we really jump in, the first thing is this. If, if you're here today and you are already reading ahead and you see children obey your parents, you see fathers do not provoke your children to anger, and you're like, okay, I don't fit any, either one of those categories because I'm not a, a little kid anymore and I don't have any kids or my kids are grown and gone, I want you to know that I think today's message is still incredibly important for you. I, I would say this message is for you because I, I, I think we all have an opportunity and a responsibility to help shape 
the next generation. Not just in our own families, but I think specifically you think about a church context. You think about a church family, a church gathering of people that represent different ages. And there's a next generation that is, that is coming up and is being shaped and formed today in these days. And I think it's the responsibility of every single one of us to help in that, to jump in and be a voice, whether it's a grandparent, an aunt, an uncle, a mom, a dad, a brother, a sister, a friend down the street, a neighbor, a coworker. I think we, we all need each other. And specifically in the church context, the church needs you. The church is better with you. My kids need you. They need your voice, a voice that's intentional, that's pointing them to something, something that's life-changing, something that helps them understand who they are and what they were designed for and the purpose that God created them for. So I want us to understand that this is for everyone. And I think it's a great opportunity for me just to put, push pause and say, hey, if you're kind of on the fence, you've been thinking, you know, I'm really, really ready to jump in and be a part of a, of a team or, you know, I want to get connected with more people here at Church Story um, I would encourage you to maybe consider the kids story team. I know some of you right away, like you heard me say that and you felt nauseous. You're like, mm, no, I'm out. But others of you, like that's something that you're wired for and that you probably enjoy and you have incredible value. And so I don't want to just say, hey, you need to join the kids story team because the kids story team needs you. I mean, it, it does because it, it, there's something about you that nobody else has to bring to the table. But even as we jump into the summer months, one of the things that's important to us is we don't want people to serve on a story team every single Sunday and then get to a point where they're exhausted and then they don't want to show up to church because they, they're tired of serving. They need a week off, but they're afraid to ask for a week off. We don't want that to be the case. And more importantly, we want those teams to be a place for community, for friendship. I heard of a lady who shared just a few weeks ago with some other ladies, and she is on the kids team. And she said, being on the kids story team has completely changed my life. And she said, I've met some of my best friends. And she said, I love it. I want to serve there every week. And we're like, you can't. <laughs> but I love that. That's what story teams are all about. So if that's maybe something you've been considering, maybe that's the final little nudge you need to get off the fence and to jump in. You can, you can let us know by filling out that card or filling out the, the online form. But this is important for all of us. The second thing is, is not only is this for you, regardless of where you are in life, the second thing I want you to know before we really jump in is my intention today is not to uh, do a drive-by guilting. I am a fellow struggler when it comes to parenting, all right? I have a 13 and a 14-year-old. Pray for me. I'm, I was a student pastor for a long time, and parents would come to me and say, hey, fix my kid. And I'm like, okay, <laughs> you know, like, like I know how to fix them. Um, I didn't, but uh, they thought I did. But now I'm, I'm, I'm in it, and I knew these days were going to come, and I've told some of you probably years ago who you had teenagers at one time, and I told you, you know, there's going to be a day I'm going to run and crawl back to you and say, I don't know what I'm doing. Can you help me? Because I know you walked through this at some point. My kids are, are, are losing their minds. Um, maybe that won't ever happen. I don't know. No, it's happening. Um, thank goodness for Brandy, uh, my wife, or they would be in a lot of trouble. All right, let's jump in. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 1. It says this. Children, obey your parents in the Lord. If your child is sitting next to you, do not elbow them at this moment, because I don't think that's going to accomplish what we want to accomplish today. But I will read it again. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with a promise, so that it may turn out well for you and that you may live long on earth. We'll stop right there and read the next verse here in just a moment. It says, children, obey your parents. And then it goes on to say, honor your father and mother. It's interesting that Paul, in this verse, ties what he is saying about obeying your parents to one of the Ten Commandments, the fifth commandment, in fact, which I think is important. Because if you go back and you read the Old Testament, you read the Ten Commandments, you know what the first four are all about. The first four commandments are all about our relationship with God specifically. That we should have no other gods before him, that we shouldn't make any kind of idol, that we should never take the Lord's name in vain, that we should always honor the Sabbath and keep it holy. That's all about our relationship vertically with God. And then it shifts to relationships with one another. But the first one, the fifth commandment, is honor your father and mother. And then it goes on, it talks about thou shalt not murder, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not covet. Um, and then there's one more. Um, but it, this one in the middle is a little bit unique. It's almost like it hinges the two parts of the commandments together. I think it's important for us to see because when we're, when we're young, I think what Paul wants us to recognize is when we're young, that parents represent authority. But they, also, they, they represent, it's a, it's, a, it's a picture, it's a relationship horizontally, it's a picture of the relationship we have vertically with God. 
authority in God. It's almost like our parents when we're young is faith with training wheels. And so the way that we interact and the way that we submit and, and recognize our parents' authority is shaping the way that we'll interact and we see God's authority in our lives as we grow up and mature as adults. So this is significant. This is important. That puts a lot of responsibility, not just on the child, but on the parents, more so on the parents. So there's a ton of responsibility. There's a ton of weight on this. And so what it means really comes down to this. As a child, when you're in the home, you're to submit to your parents' authority, to mom and dad. And the way in which you submit to your mom and dad's authority is actually how you submit to God's authority. Because God is the one that's leading Paul to communicate this to us. So there's some weight. Like, just let that sit there for a second. If you're, if you're a child, you're still living in the house, or if you're a parent, even just recognize the responsibility that you begin to feel as you think about the way that they'll interact with you and your authority is the way that they'll most likely interact with God's authority. It's something to be taken very seriously because there's some significant things that happen as a result of this. This is why discipline is so important because the way that your children respect you, the way that your children honor you, the way that your children submit to you is most likely going to be the way that they submit and respect and, and honor God as they get older. So when they get older, do they still obey mom and dad? No, they don't. Because there's a, there's, a, there's a point where we begin to transition from being shaped by our parents to being ready for launch. And we begin to live because our parents have prepared us and they've gotten us ready for living specifically under the authority of God. So while we're children, we honor God by obeying our parents. That's what Paul is saying. As an adult, you continue to honor them, but you don't necessarily have to obey them. And in one side note about obeying your parents, for those of you that are still living at home as children, if you're 30, then we need to have another conversation about that. But <laughs> what that doesn't mean is that every single thing that they say to you, you have to do because there is a, there is a line there. And if it goes against God's will, if it goes against what God says, then, then there is an opportunity for, there's an out. <laughs> There's an out there. And if it gets serious, I think that's where you, there needs to be a conversation, a cry for help. Because parents, we're not called to be abusive or to, to be manipulative in our leadership as parents. But then as we grow and we begin to still exist in that relationship as adults, we can continue to honor them. We can continue to honor our parents by, by keeping them involved, by keeping them around, by keeping in contact with them, making the phone calls, text messages. Maybe they live down the street. Maybe they, they live across town, but we, we stay engaged in the relationship. We reach out to them, ask them for advice because one, number one, they, they know because <laughs> they have life experience. But number two, there's probably not anybody in this world that cares more about you as a parent, as an adult than your, than your parents. So this, I think one of the ways that we can honor, we can honor by just showing gratitude. Thank you for all that you did for me as a child. Thank you for all that you do for me today. And then continuing to just care for them as they age. And I think this is something we struggle with as Americans. So as a child, we recognize there's a temporary authority, but the point, and the point is obedience. But it begins to shape what faith looks like. We're kind of laying the groundwork for where we're, where we're going to spend the rest of our time. But then as you leave, as you grow up, which all of us have, that authority begins to shift. And we begin to fall under the authority of God solely and no longer under the authority of mom and dad. So maybe the most significant way that we can honor our mom and dad is by living out and becoming and continuing to grow into being the man or the woman that God designed us to be, that our parents help shape in us. And then he goes on. He says in verse four, fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. This is important for us to see as parents, as in a, in a place of authority. He says, do not provoke your children to anger. Well, I've already messed that up if I'm just thinking about making my kids mad because I've made my kids mad once or twice, probably this, this, probably this morning, actually. That's not what he's talking about. He's not talking about there, there's, there's instances of anger. He's talking more specifically about a pattern of anger, a pattern of resentment that your children will begin to experience. And it's a continual thing that they begin to live with because of the way that we lead them, because of the way that we use our authority in their lives. And so we've got to be careful to not, do that in such a way that leads them to a place of resentment. So that as they grow up, they begin to think to myself, why didn't my parents tell me more about this? Or why did my parents do this? Why did my parents allow me to do this? Why did my parents not teach me this? And, and they get to a place where they're frustrated. They're disappointed. 
because they feel like maybe their parent didn't lead them in the way that they could have. They didn't do everything they could possibly do. I think this, this really kind of lands in, in three different buckets today. I want to share these three different buckets as, as a type of parent that I think we see and that Paul is really trying to warn us about the first two, but points us to the specific parent that he wants us to be. The first one is simply this, the protective parent. I think it's really easy for us to fall in this place where we want to be the protective parent. You have kids at home still. And what leads us to think this way and begin to live this way is we are responding to fear. And we become a control freak. You know what a control freak is? It's somebody who's terrified. It's why I don't like flying. Because I'm out of control. I don't have any control. And I think because I'm not in control, we're going to die. And so I would prefer to be in control, which would also be a disaster. But that's, that's why we operate in control freak mode, is because we're ultimately terrified of what could potentially happen, specifically with our kids. And so we go into overprotect mode. And we want to pr protect our kids from anything and everything that might take them out, that might lead them in a way we don't want them to go, specifically even when it comes to faith. And we can find ourselves in this place where we begin to lead everything we do with our children in a way of simply protecting them from the world around us. And it's, a, it's, a, it's a dangerous place to be. It leads us to a place of legalism. And we begin to lead our kids to, to only focus on their behavior and then keeping anything out that might be unsafe in the bubble that we want to live in. And so we shop at Mardell, Hobby Lobby, we only eat at Chick-fil-A, we only listen to KSPJ, and we keep everything else out. Because we want to protect. We don't, what if, what if they're influenced? What if they, what if they believe something that they, they don't need to believe? What if they hear something that we don't want them to hear? And so we go into this place where we protect them at all costs. If you were to take your family and you got to a place where you're like, man, I just, I gotta, I've got to do everything I can to protect my child from everything in the world. And you said, you know, I'm going to move to a deserted island. Just me and my family, my kids, we're, we're going, we're gone. We're leaving this and we're going to go, we're going to start over. Now let's say you get to that deserted island and you have no radio, you have no internet, no YouTube, no social media. You throw your cell phones into the water because you don't need those because you don't need them to make any phone calls because you don't use them to make phone calls. You use them to look at the internet, <laughs> listen to music, do everything else. But you know what? You would still have family issues because you are still there. And you and I, we're, we're messed up. We're dysfunctional. We're not perfect. We're not going to get this right. And so what happens is, is our tendency is we begin to focus so much on what we need to do and not do. And we press that down on our kids because we don't want our kids to be impacted by the carnality of the world. And it seems like the right thing. It seems right. It seems to make sense as we begin to think about it. But the problem is we go to the extreme. And if we can get everything right, then everything's going to be okay. So we become overbearing, overprotective, overthinking, overstepping, overcritical. I mean, everything is just over the top, overloaded, overcompensate. And we're over the top parents and trying to protect and keep everything out that might not be good for our children. The problem is, and I think this is what Paul is wanting us to see, is that it lands in a place of destruction. It brings destru destructive results. Because what you'll do is you'll lead your child to a place of anger and resentment. And here's why. Because our calling as parents is not to protect them so that they never are exposed to anything in the world. And then one day they move out and then they're exposed. We're called to help ready them for the world, for the brokenness, for the carnality. And if we don't, what we do is we protect, we protect, we protect, and then all of a sudden they move out into the real world and they've never experienced this before. And it either leads to a place where they completely become, stay disengaged or they lose their minds in full rebellion. Because they're like, oh man, I've been missing this my whole life. And then they don't know how to navigate life with all the things in the world. If you go all the way back to the beginning of the book of Ephesus, we started this series 10 weeks ago. You remember he's saying, Paul is helping the people in Ephesus who are now following Jesus to understand what it looks like to live in Christ as a Jesus follower while still living in Ephesus. 
And I think we've got to keep that understanding and that context as we think about the way we parent our children, the way that we raise up the next generation so that we can move past our obsession to control and to protect and make every single decision that possibly needs to be made for our children. I think it's important for us to realize that you and I, we cannot control someone to actually know Jesus. We don't have that power. We can point them to it, point them to him. We can tell them about it. We can teach them, but, and we'll talk about that in a second. But if we're not careful, we'll do everything we can to eliminate any kind of distraction from the world and at the same time eliminate every single opportunity for our children to ever be in a place to make an impact in the world. That's a dangerous place to be because that's ultimately what we've, what we've been called to do. We've seen that theme through the entire book of Ephesians. So we've got the protective parent, but then I think we also can really fall into this trap, especially in suburban Houston. And it's not the protective parent, it's the passive parent. The passive parent is not somebody that I want us to be thinking of, about as just lazy or dismissing the responsibility. But the passive parent is someone who begins to live up to a particular responsibility, not failure to live up to a specific responsibility. And what happens is, is we're, we're intentional about how we're raising our children, but we're intentional in raising them in the exact same current that the world is moving in. And it's a dangerous place because that's not what we've been called. We've been called in the Bible, it actually describes Christ followers in different places as strangers or aliens. There's supposed to be a difference. There's supposed to be a, a different way that we look. There's a, a different way that we act, a different way we respond in conversations. And so what happens is we begin to become more accepting and allowing of the things of the world because we think that it's okay. Or I hear people say sometimes, I'll hear parents say, you know what, I found my way. I'm just going to kind of do what I need to do and hope that my kid finds his way. That's not in the Bible. That's not what we're called to as Christians. It seems like it's a good idea, but it's a terrible idea because the world is pulling your child in a specific direction. And it's not the right direction. It's a destructive, dark, dysfunctional, distant direction. So we've been called to live differently. A passive parent ultimately just doesn't consider the true impact of the cultural norms. Yesterday in our house, uh, we were doing some things, really getting ready for this morning, and we were all just kind of downstairs, and Cam was in one of the office chairs that we have that the staff show up at our house a couple times a week and we've got these chairs you heard Bertie talk about the chairs it's the ones that the wheels broke on him and he fell and he was really angry about well the wheels on those chairs are awesome i mean they're like super speed and they're like they're literally like rollerblade wheels and so you start rolling on like a wood floor a tile floor and you just don't stop it just keeps going and so cam's like rolling around the house the chairs also kind of collapse and they fold up so cam's rolling around the house and as he's rolling around the house he says an object in motion stays in motion <laughs> he starts quoting Newton's first law of motion. He says, a, a, an object in motion stays in motion, stays at the same speed. And I was like, man, you're, 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 you're good. I mean, that's what we do at my house. We just talk physics all the time. I don't know about you. Um, most of the time we're praying, and then if we're not praying, we're talking physics. That's just a normal, normal day at the, the, the Jackson house. Um, that's actually not normal at all. It was really funny, though, because he started talking about that. And as he's talking about that, and we're kind of laughing, and Randy was talking about uh, the law of physics, and um, or the law of inertia, and all of a sudden Cam comes flying across the floor and there's a rug right in front of our front door. Some of you have seen it because you've been over for 101 or something, and he's going backwards and he hits that rug and all of a sudden there was a, an unbalanced factor in the situation that created a force against the motion and the speed that he was going and the chair completely collapsed, he fell over and he hit his head on the floor. And I didn't kneel, kneel down and be like, oh dude, are you all right? I just started laughing. Brady starts <laughs> laughing. We're like, man, well, you just proved that the, the, the law is real and it's, it's, it's right. And the reason I tell you that story is because there is a movement, there is a motion, and there is a speed. And I think the speed of cultural norms is not a speed that stays steady, it's a speed that accelerates. And the more we move at that speed, the faster we begin to go. And the further we get away from who God has designed us to be. And when we think about our children, I think it's important that we focus in and say, hey, you know what? I'm not going to be passive and just assume that the way the world is telling me to raise my children and lead my children is the right way. Maybe there needs to be some force against that motion, against that speed, against that acceleration that God has called me to, to lead my children to a better place. But we're passive to that. And we think, well, I'm just going to keep moving 
this direction. And what Paul would say is he's saying there's discipline required. And nothing I've experienced in my life that's required discipline has been easy. In fact, the way I just describe, the way I define discipline in my own life is really just this. Do terrible hard things. Terribly hard things. Not terrible like don't go do terrible things, but terribly hard things because it's not easy. But there's a benefit down the road that's so much better than just going with the flow. I've been intentional about something in my house. My wife and I both graduated from Texas A&M. And we started raising our, man, see, I know how to pray for you now. Um, <laughs> but we started at a young age, brainwashing our kids with all the things. We don't boo. Um, for those of you who like to boo, there might be some in the room. Um, we hiss. We, we, do, we do ridiculous things. I'll admit, Aggies can be a little bit obnoxious. But we, we love our school. We have an affinity for our school. So we've raised our boys to wear maroon and to understand some of the traditions of Aggie land and follow A&M sports. And we've been intentional about that. And it's, it's working so far. If they decide, if one day they come to me and they say they want to walk away from God's will for their life and go to the University of Texas, um, um, I'm just going to disown them and give them a different name. But we've been intentional in that. And I'm being a little bit ridiculous. It's really not that big of a deal to me. I've actually, actually, you know what I haven't been intentional with is I have not been intentional with their um, affection for any NFL teams. And so now I live in a house with a Cowboys fan and a Saints fan. I don't understand, but God is punishing for me for my sin. Um, and he's also led my boys to a great place of disappointment because neither one of those teams have done anything significant since my boys were born. And so they just live in constant disappointment. Um, it's brutal. But what Paul is saying, he's saying there needs to be something intentional done. There needs to be something that you're focused in, something that you're pursuing for your children. And I think what we do in our culture today is we look at that current, we look at the direction that the world is going, we look at the direction and the, the pursuits of the world, the speed of the world, and this is what we think. We think to ourselves, I need to stay ahead of the pack. I need to stay at the front of the line. I need to stay at the front of that current. I need to keep moving and move faster than everybody else for my kids' sake. Because I want my kid to be happy. I want my kid to be successful. I want my kid to be seen and known. And a lot of times the motivation isn't because we want that for our kids. A lot of times the motivation is because that's the way that we were raised. It's the cycle that we were raised in. And there's a void in us because of that. And so we begin to try to fill that void with the pursuits for our children. It's so misleading. It's so incredibly dangerous. We become focused on the pursuits, the successes, the happiness of our children. And what we do is we begin to stay focused on the promotion and the prevention of anything that might keep our children from having the things we think they need to have to have a good life. This is where we find hel helicopter moms hovering over their children to protect them from anything that might keep them from having what we think is best. Or lawnmower dads, snowplow dads, whatever you want to call it, who just bulldoze everything out in front of their children so their children can find their way to success and happiness and worth. Why? Why do we do this? Because we believe the lie ourselves. That the pursuit of success is the pursuit we need to be on and the pursuit we need to be leading our children in. It's incredibly dangerous. We think success at all costs. They gotta make the grade. They gotta wear the clothes so they at least look successful. They gotta make the team. They gotta make the club, they got to experience all of these experiences that we see everybody else's kids experiencing on Facebook and social media. And so we run, we run, we run, we run, we run. Success, success, success. I read a study last week. Um, Julie Hames talked about this. She's a graduate of Harvard Law, and she was the dean of students at Stanford University. And she said that in, in the study, she said she began to notice that parents of students were lingering longer with their children after their children graduated from high school and began the pursuit of college and further education and jobs. Parents were lingering longer and helping with the registration process for the kids, registering for classes for their kids. That they were doing things that their kids used to be able to do for themselves. And then they would, then they would graduate and they would continue to linger. And then she mentions the study from the Collegiate Employee Research Institute, the CERI. This is a study specifically on the parental engagement with children and the workforce post-college. Here's some fascinating statistics that this study found. They said first that 40% of parents post-college 
obtained, obtained job info for their children, trying to help their children find the job that the parent thinks they need to have. 31% actually submitted resumes for their children post-college. 26% advocate for their kids to get the job. 15% complain if their child doesn't get the job. Would make a formal complaint to the potential employer. 4% actually attended the interview with their child. <laughs> We're all laughing, but this is a pretty big group of people. And it says 4%, so there's probably somebody sitting in here, you're thinking, that might have been me. <laughs> or maybe it's scheduled next week, I, I don't know. And then lastly, it said that 6% of parents advocate for a raise or an advancement for their child on the job. Can you imagine that? Mom shows up, says, hey, I want to talk to your boss because you need a raise. You've been working too hard. It's crazy. But what's happening is we become so obsessed with what we think is most important, what we think they have to have. I heard another guy talking on a podcast about an experience he had in Palo Alto, California. He moved to Palo Alto, California and lived there for a couple of years. One of the most affluent, um, success-driven communities in the entire world. They said they were driving down a road called Camino Real. Maybe you're familiar with it. And parallel to this road, the Camino Real, is railroad tracks that run parallel. And he noticed that every so often there were these blue tents with a security guard next to the railroad tracks. And after he saw a few of them, he looked at his driver and he said, hey, what, what's with the blue tents and the railroad tracks? He said, the driver said, well, it's, you don't see it on the news because they don't really want to talk about it because they're fearful of, of copycats. But what they've had to do is they've had to put these tents up with these security guards because they don't want any more nine to 10 year olds jumping in front of trains. And he went on to talk about this and he said, what? why? Like, I, I can't even under, begin to wrap my mind around that. He said, we live in one of the most successful, driven parts of America. And parents are pressing their children to be successful. And children are finding themselves in a place where they're not making the grade. They're not meeting the standard that their parents think they should be meeting. And so they begin to think to themselves, what, what am I going to do? What are my parents going to be able to do with me? I'm a disappointment. I'm a failure. Devastated for what it means and how their mom or dad's going to react. And it leads them to this place. Success idols kill. And not, not just literally, but they do begin to take life. Anytime we begin to put success as ultimate in our life, it leads us to a place where we begin to, to lose life. It's just as devastating. It's leading us away from the maker and author of life, God. And if you're in a place where you're like, man, I don't, I don't know if that's true about me. Is that true about me? I don't know. Just ask yourself this question, because this is a thought that came to my mind this week. And this was, a, this was a sobering question for myself. So I'm not saying this to be like, ah, I got you. When you think about just a normal week, a normal day with your children, what do you talk about more? What are you focused on more with your kids? Their GPA or G-O-D? And I'll just tell you, I don't like, where that answer lands for me. And so I think we have to be careful because what happens is we're passive and we just go with the flow because this is what everybody else is doing and we gotta stay ahead or we're gonna get left behind and we're not gonna have the life for our kids that we think our kids need. And we begin to misunderstand the role of parents. This is what Paul is wanting us to see is what he wants us to recognize and understand is the responsibility that we have. And rather than focusing on success and happiness, Paul is saying, focus on readiness because there's a transition that's gonna take place. Are they ready for that transition? Parenting is hard, but it's the most important responsibility that I think we have in this world is raising up the next generation. Let me give you some other data. Just, I'm a statistics guy, I love numbers, because I think it helps paint a really clear picture of the reality in our world. I was looking up a lot of this the last couple of weeks in preparation for this, and I'm kind of bummed that I, found some of these. But I read last week that 95% of 13 to 18 year olds own a smartphone. And that doesn't seem like that big of a deal. 
except when you begin to read a little bit further, because it says that the typical 15 to 23 year old spends 2,767 hours per year using some sort of media on a smartphone device. That's equivalent to, if you put all that time together, 115 days out of the year. That's a lot of time. That's 32% of their year is spent watching a screen, texting, watching YouTube, social media, maybe some productive things. It's not all just wasted time, but that's a lot of time. What's fascinating is the average person that same age, 15 to 23 years old, spends 29% of their year sleeping. And so as the media consumption number continues to increase, the average number, the average number, average hours slept every night is on the de decline, is decreasing. This is a dangerous thing because what's beginning to happen is we're beginning to see mental health skyrocket. Teenagers finding themselves dealing with depression and anxiety because they're, they're looking at a device and it feels like they're connected with people. It feels like there's a social environment they're participating in, but they're actually becoming more disconnected, more disengaged. They're, they're not getting the social interaction. And so they find themselves in a place of loneliness, which leads them to a place of anxiety, and depression, their mental health is impacted. Anxiety and depression are all time high for teenagers. When you think about it, Childhoods look so much more different than they did when I was growing up, when you were probably growing up, if you're a parent or an adult. I mean, my parents used to be like, early in the morning, oh, you're, you're leaving? All right, well, be safe. And like, we'd be gone all day. We would go places, my parents didn't even know we were going. We'd like, ride our bikes miles out into the desert. Like, they had no idea, there were no, no phones, no Life 360, they couldn't track us, be like, oh, they're out, they're out, oh, they're on top of that mountain. Like it, but we would just show back up at home. There's something in that that I think was valuable because we were learning how to be responsible for ourselves. We didn't always get it right. We did a lot of dumb things. But there's something in it that I think is important. But we've, we've lost that. And because we've got constant engagement that we're finding, we're, we're losing creativity. Our minds are, are not developing the way that they're supposed to when we're young because we're constantly being focused and drawn into and led by whatever we're watching on the screen. It's a dangerous, dangerous place. But what happens is, is what we see is what we ultimately begin to do. And there's a force of darkness in our world. And it lives in the media. And we're allowing that to lead our children because we're passive to that. Or we think that's, a, that's okay. It's what everybody else does. I don't know if you've ever had your kid tell you that. I know that I have. Dad, everybody else has social media. Everybody else has social, has, has Snapchat, everybody else. And I'm like, well, I guess you're going to be the only one that doesn't. <laughs> poor, guy, poor guy. And they get frustrated with me and they say, everybody else. You know what's fascinating? I begin to have a conversation with other parents and they're like, no, my kid doesn't have that either. And I'm like, see, you don't, that's, that's not the truth. <laughs> so we've got to be careful because we weren't called to be their best friend. We were called to be their parent. And there's a different level of responsibility that comes with that. And so we've got to be incredibly careful and we've got to wake up to the responsibility of this and I've said this before but I think what's so important for us to understand is that it is so much easier to build up a young boy a young girl than to repair an adult man or an adult woman and there's a responsibility that if we're not careful we'll just dismiss it and then we'll look back and we think man I could have done so much more and it happens so fast we know that those of you that already passed that point in your life, you're the ones that tell me all the time, it's gonna be gone, just like in the snap of a finger, it's gonna, it's gonna be over. And I used to think, no, oh, it's not gonna go that fast. And now I'm like, oh shoot, like we're, we're in the single digits of years before it's all over and they're gone and they're, they're ready. Will they be ready? Well, I think if we want them to be ready, let's go Old Testament, let's land here. It says, and you shall love the Lord your God. And this is Deuteronomy chapter six, verse five. Moses says, Writing this, this is Moses' collections of, of speeches that, that God gave him for the next generation of Israel as they entered into the promised land. And we read this a couple weeks ago for child dedication. It says, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. These words which I am commanding you today shall be on your heart, and you shall repeat them diligently to your sons and speak of them when you sit in your house, when you walk on the road, when you lie down, and when you get up. In other words, all the time, <laughs> over and over. Verse 8 says, you shall also tie them as a sign to your head, and they shall be as a frontlets on your forehead. 
You shall also write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. In other words, keep them in front of you all the time. Be intentional. So rather than trying to be the protective parent or the passive parent, I think what God's called us to and what Paul wants us to see is we've been called to be a purposed parent. There's a purpose behind the way that we're parenting. And it's not to follow the trends of the culture and the world and the things going on around us. It's to ultimately do this. And I think it's what Moses says in that very first verse. What is it that we're called to do? It's not to, hey, go be a good parent and get it right. What is it we're supposed to do? We're called to love the Lord our God with all our heart, with all our strength, with all our mind. He says, here's the, here's the model. You want to get it right as a parent, love the Lord your God. Why is that significant? Because you and I don't do what we do because it's right or wrong. We do what we do because it's something that we love. I mean, think about this. You go to a restaurant today for lunch, you're going to celebrate maybe the moms in your life and you show up and you look at the menu, you're like, man, you know, I really want to get healthy. And so you see that chicken breast with the, the brown rice and the steamed vegetables. But then right next to that, you see the chicken fried steak with drowning in gravy and like some of you are like, yes, amen, yes, Jesus, thank you. What do you choose? Like, you know what's better for you, but do you love being healthy or do you love that chicken fried steak and all its grease and calories and just goodness from heaven? Like, what, what is it that you love? Well, if you, if you love the chicken fried steak, you're gonna have a really hard time choosing what's right and what's good and what's better for you. It's the same way when it comes to our relationship. You and I cannot shape the faith of our children if we're not cultivating faith for ourselves. And so before we begin to think about how we're leading our children, I think what Moses wants us to see is he wants us to see, like, you just focus on loving the Lord your God. Let your affections stir for him. Let your, let your mind be, a, be focused on him. Purpose parents are, pur are, are parents who are described or characterized by their devotion for Jesus before their kids. Because when we get that right, we find the value of what it looks like to have a relationship with Jesus. And we recognize that that relationship with Jesus far outweighs the success the world is calling us to. And so instead of just going the way of the world, we decide to kind of put some, create some tension there. Let's, let's go a different direction. Let's change the motion, change the speed, change the direction because we found what is ultimate in a man named Jesus. And so let's let our affections be stirred there. How do I do that? How do I love the Lord my God? Like, like really practical, Wes, what does that look like? Like, how do I love the Lord my God with all my heart, all my soul, all my mind, all my strength? Well, think about it. Like, what are some of those things? Gather, come to church. I think this is, this is a great way to cultivate that faith. Read your Bible, pray, carve out some time early in the morning. I love early mornings when, when I can just kind of unplug from anything. Everybody's still asleep. It's dark. It's quiet. Just takes a moment to just kind of sit, to journal. Maybe it's podcast. Maybe it's jumping on a story team. Maybe it's, it's reading a book, listening to music while you're getting ready in the morning instead of it being just some random music on the radio, being intentional about some of the music, maybe some of the songs that we sing here on Sundays. Let that begin to shape who God is but who, and what God's done. And let that begin to stir our affections for him. And then as you do that, do you, do you see what it says? It says, then you shall repeat them diligently to your children. Repeat what? Speak what? The things that you're experiencing in God, the things that you're learning about God, the things that you know are true about God. Speak about those things. Teach them those things. And I know what you're thinking, because this is what I think. I don't have time for that. Like with the baseball practices and the, 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 the job requirements and the family responsibilities and everybody's got those. There's all these things. Like, I don't have time for this. But it's almost like God knew that we were going to be busy. And so what does he continue on to say? He says, and speak of them when you sit in your house, when you walk on the road, when you lie down, and when you get up. Listen, you can do this. Because I thought to myself, I was like, man, this, this is a lot. How, how do we do this? You can do this on the couch, driving down the road, sitting in the backyard, I thought about this just this week. This is a really busy week for me. Had a lot of things going on, some unexpected things go on. Uh, just a busy week. I mean, most weeks are busy for all of us. And I started thinking about this. What would this have looked like last week for me? To speak and be verbal about the things that I know about God, the things I've experienced about God. What would that have been like? Did I have time? No, I didn't have any time. I was always doing something. And then I thought to myself, you know how, many, how much time I had in the vehicle driving down the road with one of my boys? And so I added it up this week. 
Monday, I had an hour. Tuesday, I had another hour. Wednesday, didn't have any time on Wednesday in the car. Thursday, one hour in the car with one of my boys. Friday, I had 15 minutes. Saturday, another hour. Four hours and 15 minutes in the car with just one of my kids. I would say I had time. How are we leveraging that time, being intentional about that time? It's so much easier to just be passive. I think this is what we're called to do, to connect with our children, but to be intentional about pointing them to the one that we love, the one that we honor, the one that we trust, the one that we fall under the authority of, God himself. He says, when they lay down, when you wake up, all the time, look for the moments to shape their faith because of what your faith has been shaped like in Christ. It's not always easy. I mean, there's days at my house, I get up in the morning sometimes, I'm like, I I don't even know how to operate with this mess. (laughs) I mean, there's temper tantrums, there's yelling, there's Pop-Tarts for breakfast, and that's just like for me. <laughs> um, there's a, dad, where's my shoe? Because I lost it, you know, you know, it's like, and then they get out the door and they, they head to the bus stop and I'm thinking in my head, that old Chumba Wumba song when I was in high school, I get knocked down, but I get up again. You're never gonna keep me down, sucker. Like, get out of here, go get on the bus. Like, there's days like that, but not every day is like that. There can become a pattern like that. But being intentional in those days where it's not crazy, interrupt the chaos with some just time to sit down and to reflect and to pray. Talk to your kids. Hey, what, how's, how's your week going? Tell me your high point and your low point from today. And then begin to pray around that because it teaches them gratitude and it teaches them to trust in God to provide for what they need when they're down or when they're out. Listen, you and I can do this. It's possible. Paul's ultimate intent here through all of this is that we would know God, that we would trust God, and our lives would be a response to that in the way that we interact with one another, but specifically in the way that we parent the next generation, the way that we lead the next generation. I believe you can crush it this week. Dads, you can crush it this week. Moms, you're probably crushing it already, but you can continue to crush it this week. It's possible. And as you do, you'll begin to shape the faith of those around you. What Paul wants us to see ultimately is that this starts with me. That's what Moses is saying. He's saying, love the Lord your God. It all starts with you. And I'll close with this. Some of you know my mom's story, and um, it's a story that we've shared before, but I was thinking about this this week, and I was just thinking about this passage, and like, what does this look like? And I thought to myself, you know what? I've, I've, I've seen this. I've seen this picture. My mom grew up with a really difficult childhood. She lost her mom when she was in elementary, and then that led to just a lot of dysfunction, a lot of hurt abandonment, pain, addiction, a lot of the, a lot of, a lot of the just dysfunctional family dynamics because that, it was just a, it was a difficult situation. And that's, that's the culture that she, she grew up in. And it was difficult, it was painful. And it's still difficult and painful for her. I think she would tell you that. And you've always heard, you know, the apple never falls very far from the tree. You know what, that wasn't true for me because my life didn't follow the same pattern from what she had experienced, how she grew up. Why not? Well, 1 Corinthians 11.1 1 says, Paul is, Paul is writing to the church at Corinth, and he says, be imitators as me, be imitators of me, as just as I also am of Christ. Be imitators of me, not because of who I am, but because I'm imitating Christ. So as parents, imitate me because I'm looking to Jesus. And I tell you the story of my mom because the reason my life didn't follow the same pattern of hers at 1004 Austin Street is because she met this man named Jesus. I remember when she began to really press into her own personal faith, when she began to follow Jesus. And I remember walking by her bedroom, she'd be sitting on her bed, reading her Bible, writing notes in her Bible, writing in her journal. I remember her sitting with us at night, praying every single night for us. And I'm just like, mom, just keep praying. Because while she was praying, she was scratching my back. And I was like, you just pray as long as you want to, mom. Like, just do what you got to do. If the Lord calls and he is like, just, just, don't disobey, don't disobey what God's telling you to do. Keep scratching. But she was consistent. Despite the heartache and the pain, she could have used that as the excuse to say, I'm not capable of doing this. There's no way. She didn't. She chose something different. And she helped shape something different for me and my brothers. I think it's significant for us to to see that because she was modeling what a relationship with Jesus looked like. Your kids, they hear what you say, but they're gonna do 
what they watch you do. And I'm thankful for my mom. I'm thankful for my dad. They both live that way. We didn't sit down a lot and like do Bible studies. All right, let's walk through the book of, all right, let's like, but it was like through just everyday life, the journey of life, taking advantage of the moments to point to God, to know God. This is what God's calling us to as parents and really as a church for the next generation. Why? Because God uses transformed people to transform people. And there's a transformation he wants to do in you, but there's a transformation he also wants to do through you, and specifically as parents. It's not easy, but it's worth it. Let's pray.